pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Our story for this morning is not as well known as a lot of the Bible stories. And yet, when I was young and, and even into uh, my midlife, I still can encounter lots of people that know the last teaching of Jesus. You always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. I want to focus on this particular part of the story this morning. And as I do that, I have a few questions that came to mind. You know, what does this mean and how do we apply it in our lives? As I was thinking about those questions and this story this week, a couple of ideas shook free from my mind. The first was a proverb that my grandma always said to me. Birds of a feather flock together, right? And the second one is a movie called A Walk to Remember. So with those two ideas, what I thought we would do this morning is we'd start by trying to understand what Jesus means in this teaching. Then we'd play around with this proverb a little bit. And then we'd end with the movie A Walk to Remember. See what it can teach us as we come to the end of our Lenten walk with Jesus approaching the passion and the cross. So when we think about this phrase, you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me, the first interpretation that I came across when I was younger is that our first priority must always be Jesus. We must pay attention to our spiritual life more than our physical life or more than with the poor. This makes sense in some ways. I mean, how can we care for the poor with the compassion of God if our hearts are not deeply connected to our Lord? And yet, it has an unintended consequence in this teaching. It separates out our spiritual life from our physical life. Specifically, a concentration on our relationship with Jesus only creates this divide between our relationship with Jesus and the suffering of others. Okay. With this comes this artificial argument that I have heard almost all of my life. Our first priority is to share the gospel, to save people's souls. And we should not really worry about a social gospel and meeting their needs until we've done that. Now, in our walk with Jesus through Lent towards the cross, I think the one truth about this is that our spiritual life and our physical life are connected. We can't separate them. They are one. That's the first thing I'll say about that first interpretation. The second interpretation that I've encountered with this last phrase or teaching of Jesus in this story is that Jesus is somehow saying that poverty is inevitable. That the poor will always be poor and there will always be poor people. With this idea then, we get the notion that we're always called to care for the poor but we have no responsibility to end poverty itself. Now what this does, I think, is just like we have a separation between our spiritual life and our physical life, now we have a separation between ourselves and the poor. They are somehow less than, and we are somehow more than. Whenever we separate ourselves off or we think that there's a cast of poor people that will always be around, we create a place for judgment. Because we want to understand why this is the case. So, I don't know if you want to admit it, but I'll admit it these thoughts sometimes slip into my mind and I don't think I'm unique. So they might think slip into your mind. The poor are poor because of some moral judgment. They're bad. 
Or maybe the poor are poor because they have some kind of inferior intellect or inferior work ethic. The poor are lazy. And if they just work, they wouldn't be poor. Or we say to ourselves, if they just be like us, make decisions like us, act like us, dress like us, then we wouldn't have to help them because they would help themselves. Am I the only one who's let those kinds of thoughts slip into my head? I don't think so. When we dive deep into the text, though, we find something interesting that might shake those judgments free from our mind. It goes like this. The Greek verb for have, you always have the poor with you, that Greek verb is ambiguous. It can be translated in a multiple ways. The first way is in the indicative case, right? which is a statement of fact. That's how it's translated in our text this morning. You always have the poor with you. But the second way we could translate it is the imperative case, which is a statement of command. And that translation would be, always have the poor with you. Now this eliminates the separation that we make between the physical and the spiritual, it eliminates the separation that we can make when we think poverty is inevitable and they're less than us and we're more than them. Because Jesus is saying, always have them with you. We see the truth of that teaching in Matthew 25 when Jesus tells his disciples, whatever you do to the least of these you do to me. We cannot then separate the spiritual and the physical because what we recognize is that Christ is in the poor just like Christ is in me. We are one, not meant to be separated. Now if this is the case, then when we go to serve and help and care for the poor, our attitude should never be, thank God I'm not in that place. Or our attitude should never be, there but the grace of God go I, as somehow we're separate, above and below. Instead, our attitude must be, there I am. Because Christ is in the poor and Christ is in me, so therefore in Christ we are one. The Gospel has this great teaching that we never care or offer service and love from a distance, but we are called to gather everyone into the body of Christ. Which brings me to the proverb. Birds of a feather flock together. I think what my grandma was trying to teach me in that is that who you gather around yourself, who you hang out with, reveals something about you. Now, if this is true, if my grandma was right, and I think she was, then Jesus is trying to teach us something about when he commands us to always have the poor with us. That we are of the same feathers. And we are meant to fly together. You see, if you help or care for somebody from a distance, the best you can offer them is sympathy. Sympathy is compassion without closeness. Sympathy is recognizing their lot, but not recognizing your connection to it. That you're one. When Jesus says that we are meant to be drawn in together, he draws us beyond sympathy and brings us into empathy. 
And empathy is the way in which God changes us, transforms us. Did you know that science has taught us that the brain actually begins to change based on those who we are around? based on those who we gather around. So the proverb is true in its wisdom, but it's also true in how our brains form. What I think Jesus is doing is he's saying, if you want to be open to the deeper truth of how God's compassion works, to see as God sees, then you must have the poor with you. Because in that, your brain, the way you see, the way you understand the world, will begin to be transformed. This is the point of the incarnation, isn't it? Jesus comes to be with us, to share in our lives, to offer more than sympathy, but to offer God's empathy. Jesus comes in flesh and He says to us, we are one. And in a deep sense, this is the only way in which we can be transformed and Jesus is transformed before us. Now the truth is, that some in our midst will require more help and service in order to receive the shalom of mind, body, and spirit that Jesus promised. But that doesn't make them less than or us better. And we only begin to see that truth when we are gathered together. Now let's look at the movie, right? A Walk to Remember. It's the story of a popular boy and an ostracized girl. He is the rebel and she is the daughter of the minister, the lady and the tramp. Right? And in his rebellion, he is punished by being made to participate in the school play. Right? He takes on a main character and she takes on a main character and he cannot memorize, li memorize his lines. He's struggling to figure it out, so what does he do? He asks for her help, and what does she do? She helps, of course. And they meet together and come together, and there's something of a transformation for both of them. His heart begins to open up as he sees who she is. But then something else happens, right? She picks him up from school and they're heading back to her house to continue to work and memorize their lines and work on the play. And they drive through the center of town and they come to a light where they must stop. And he sees all of his popular friends over on the right-hand side. And what does he do? Huh? He begins to slide down low into the seat so that nobody can see him with her. Somehow, even as his heart has opened up, he feels this sense in which being with her will diminish him. Here's the thing. The problem is not a distinction between what we do and what we believe. The problem is what we do reveals what we believe. We can gather the poor among us, but if we're ashamed to be seen with them, if we're unwilling to open up a spot at our tables or in our leadership or gather them in such a way as the whole world knows that they are one with us, then what do we believe? 
what we do reveals what we believe. Now later on in the movie, the young girl is in the cafeteria and the popular kids are mocking her, laughing at her, scorning her, and embarrassing her with a photoshopped picture. The rebel enters into the cafeteria and puts a stop to all the derision. And then he gathers her into his arms before everyone. What he does reveals what he believes. She is worthy. He loves her. And she will never diminish him. If we are to answer the command of Christ, we are called to see Christ in the poor. And see Christ in the in us and see Christ as we are together before the world in love. Only in this, only in recognizing the command that we are one and then living it before the world, only in that can we undo the thinking that despises, judges, and embarrasses the poor? And then we know that we are called to not only end that thinking, but put an end to any system that causes poverty, no matter the cost, no matter what it takes. Because Christ is in them and Christ is in me. So Christ is in us. If we believe the incarnation, if we believe that Jesus is with us to transform us. And if we're not ashamed of that fact, then we cannot help but work to end poverty. May you always have the poor with you. May you understand that you are one because you have the same feathers and you fly together. And as your eyes are open to this fact in Christ, may you work diligently to end judgment, to end poverty, and to recognize that we are one in Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, help us to set aside the ideas that poverty are, is inevitable and cannot be eliminated. Help us to set aside the ideas that the spiritual and the physical must be separated, but in fact we find you present with us in the physical. Help us to recognize that we are one. And just as you made yourself poor on the cross for our salvation, and we are called to join in with you for our salvation, so also are we called to join with the poor for you are with them and you are with us. Let us never be embarrassed. 
Let our actions reveal what we believe. May your grace lead us forward into generosity, into a vision of goodness and grace. Draw us to the table where we receive spiritual food in the nurturing of a physical bread and cup. Draw us as one around the table. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Beloved,